for joining me today for a walk in the garden on NCTV Norfolk Community Cable Television. I'm Liz Davey and this is a program that is a series that is done in my garden in Norfolk. We go through the garden in year and actually we've gone all year working some in the kitchen too and we learn about what's coming up, what needs to be done in the garden and the good, the bad and the ugly sometimes and this is quite a change from our last episode, which was only three weeks ago. In the meantime, spring has sprung and we have a lot of things coming up. Uh, I'm in the herb garden right now and I see signs of a lot of herbs that have started their journey to full maturity this spring. Uh, we aren't there yet, but we do need to trim back a few things. And one of them is southern woods, and this does have some green on it, but we'll trim this one all the way back. And I have several varieties of this. One is a gray color, and this, uh, this one is a green. And we want to trim that back so that it isn't all leggy. And then it will uh, come out as a, a nicer looking shrub. I won't go all the way back to the ground. We'll give it about four or five inches and certainly cut off any parts that appear dead. Throw that in the basket. It's a time to clean up. Uh, the oak leaves are coming down, so clean up is kind of an ongoing thing. A number of the times are starting to show green. Uh, Garlic chives are up, regular chives are up, and I've transplanted some of those to fill the row uh, so that I have an entire row of chives. They're one of the things I use a lot, so I want that up. The sorrel is coming up, and that'll be ready to use in just a few weeks, as will the chives. This is another southern wood, and I'll be cutting that one back. You can see growth down, way down on the stems, and I'll cut that one back down almost to the ground maybe three or four inches. And again, it will neaten it up. We've also uh, started, almost finished hanging birdhouses, making sure they're clean for the new residents because the birds are definitely around now. Uh, every morning is filled with bird song. Last fall, <clears throat> I decided to test the soil in the herb garden with the UMass extension. You send in a sample. If you go online, you can find uh, all the information you need in a form, and you send them your soil sample. They tell you how to do it, and $10, and they send you this lovely report on your soil and what it might need. Also, if you go online, it will tell you a step-by-step -step fertilizer guide. The reason that is is because fertilizers are listed with the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That, those are the three numbers that you see on the label of a fertilizer. Well, this one turned out to have too much phosphorus. It was, uh, has adequate in other areas. The nitrogen, it needs a little bit, and it needed quite a bit of uh, potassium. So what I'm going to put in it, uh, it doesn't need phosphorus, so I can't just use a 10-10-10, a balanced fertilizer. So potassium is found in potash, and so I got potash, and this is, the numbers on this one are 0, 0, 0060. So you have to do some mathematical computation to see how much you need to add to add the amount for the uh, size of the garden. Also, you need to measure the garden and figure out the square footage. I did the math, 
And in order to get it to the place it needs to be, we only need three quarters of a pound of the, this potash because it is so concentrated. So what I'll do is just scatter it very thinly and probably go over it a couple times. But for this whole area, I only need this three quarters of a pound. We are expecting some rain, so, but we'll just scatter it lightly. And this should help the plants to utilize the other important things that are covered. The calcium, the magnesium, the phosphorus, that's already there. It will also help it use the nitrogen. And again, just three quarters of a pound for the whole thing. So. We scatter it very lightly. Doesn't take much to give it what it needs. We should see some increased vigor in some of these herbs. Some of them were starting to not grow as much as they could. The other thing that we need is a bit of nitrogen without too much phosphorus. Uh, this is rose food and it's 12, 4, 8. So it gives us a little more potassium, uh, but it gives us a higher nitrogen, which this garden can use. So I'm using a little rose fertilizer on it. I do have a few roses here, but this will just broadcast a little bit. And it turned out that I need a pound of this to give it just one-tenth of a percent. And again, we'll just spray, sprinkle it around, maybe concentrate a little on my roses that are in here. I have a couple. It's kind of easy to see because it has little colored particles. These are natural fertilizers that I'm using. And it is supposed to do some raining, so that'll help soak it in. If we don't get rain, I will water it in. I did not guess the weight of this. I actually weighed it on a scale. Let me move it aside to get some under the basket. While we're talking about fertilizers, now is the time when the forsythia is in bloom, and that will be very shortly. It's fully budded. That's the yellow bush that you see all over town. And when those are in bloom, it's the time to do your first lawn fertilizer. And that's the one that includes the crabgrass preventer if you choose to use it, the corn gluten product that will uh, prevent crabgrass from germinating. And the first uh, Fertilizing is done when the forsythia is in bloom. That's a good guide plant. Uh, it can be earlier or later. Usually things are a little earlier coming up. This year they're popping up really fast, but they still are a little behind due to all the snow cover that we had. Fortunately, that's mostly gone. A uh, few piles out by the street yet, but most of it is gone. Now let's walk down to the perennial garden. I cut back most of the perennials in the fall, but I saved a few just for winter interest, and uh, it's time now to get rid of those and cut back these. This is a sedum, sedum autumn joy. It's a popular plant, and we want to cut that back, cut all the old stems off. It was hard to wait for all the snow to melt in spring to be, be here, but now that it's here, it's hard to decide what to do first in the garden. There are so many things that need to be done, cleaning up, picking up, and cutting back. I'm glad I cut back most of them in the fall. It's given me a head start on spring.
All the while you have to be careful not to step on other things as you work on plants. This plant will get about two feet tall and then it blooms in the late summer and fall. Pale pink blooms at first that turn a deep red. I have these spaced around the garden, some I've already cut. This one needed to be done. Now that we can see these tender green shoots, uh, we do need to deer spray it because the deer will take a mouthful of it just as if it were a big cabbage. And uh, that will influence the way it looks for the rest of the season. So you want to use the deer spray on this as well as on bulbs. And I have it ready to go. And I also use it on all my tulips and crocuses. Daffodils, the deer don't bother. They will sometimes go for day lilies, but uh, most of the time they prefer the tulips. They're kind of like dessert for the deer. Uh, hyacinths also seem to be okay, but the other bulbs, the tulips and the crocuses, are their favorites. This is a hydrangea, and I'm going to wait a little while to prune it to see if any of the new growth comes back. Because of the snow cover, many of the things were insulated pretty well, and they look pretty good this year. Uh, we did have the cold, but we had a good snow cover, so we may get some uh, buds further up on this plant. If not, it will be cut to the ground as soon as it starts to leaf out or come up. With hydrangeas, you need to put on something to either make the soil more acid to get blue flowers or more alkaline to get pink flowers. If you have one that blooms in white, you don't have to worry about it at all. This one should be a blue flower, and this uh, time we're going to put on uh, blue magic, and what it is is aluminum sulfate, and that will acidify the soil around this plant. So I'm just gonna add quite a bit around it. This can also be used on blueberries uh, and is recommended because they like a really acid soil. You definitely don't want to put any lime on these. And I'll just scratch that into the area around it. Come out about under the branches. And again, pick up the leaves. We can see some shoots starting to come up from the base. I will prune this back and possibly, very possibly, all the way to the ground will be what it needs. Uh, frequently that's what the hydrangeas of this nature require. Okay, let's move over to another area of the garden. I planted a few new rhubarb plants this year and they're in this area and I've already fertilized them. I planted one new rhubarb. My rhubarb seemed to be getting a little uh, sparse. What I need to do is divide one big clump 
and that needs to be done in the next week or two. And this one is a coral bell plant. Uh, Hookera is other name for it. And it has uh, a lot of little shoots around it. And so what I want to attempt to do is divide this and make other smaller plants. Now we first have to dig it up a little, get it out of the ground, and then we can see the root structure on some of these and break off pieces to be replanted. It has a long root with the area on top that sprouts new leaves. So what I'll do is divide a number of these and pot it up and see how they do. Uh, hopefully getting enough root. And I'll use potting soil for that. Bring it into the middle a little. We'll set this in a shady spot. I have an area where I put plants that I have divided, and many of these will go to the Norfolk Garden Club plant sale, which is the 16th of May. By digging them now, they have a chance to become a little larger, and we know they're going to live if they start putting out good leaves. I have a rose right here. It's starting to leaf out, but again, I'm going to wait a little bit. Uh, I see some small leaves. You prune off anything that looks apparent really dead or broken. But I want to wait a little bit to uh, completely prune this little rose and the other roses I have. At the time I prune them, I'll put on rose fertilizer. Just scratch in a bit around the base. They need a lot of food in order to bloom nicely. My general rule of thumb is to prune my roses when the Red Sox come back to Fenway, and that was Monday, but it's still a little early. As I said, our season this year is just a bit behind, so we're a little behind schedule, and probably we've caught up. We were maybe a month behind three weeks ago, and now we're maybe a week or two behind. Moving down this way, we have a lot of plants coming up. If you remember, if you've watched me before, I had uh, buckets of leaves, oak leaves, over various plants, lavender and chrysanthemums being one of them. This one was over this chrysanthemum, and I removed it, and we can take off the stems back to the ground. This chrysanthemum has spread. It was planted two years ago. And I'll also be able to divide this into about three different plants. And I'll either plant them around my garden or again they will go to the garden club sale. Chrysanthemums that you put in in the spring will tend to come back every year if taken care of and divided, or at least for a number of years. Most people put their chrysanthemums in in the fall. And if you put them in at the fall, they don't have time to form a good root system, and they generally do not survive the season. Occasionally one will, but it is very occasionally. If you want your chrysanthemums to come back, then the time to plant them, there's a root takeoff, is in the spring. The problem is they aren't available in the garden centers in the spring, only in the fall. So they are available on mail order, and that's how I have gotten my chrysanthemums, I mail order them and they're a lot less expensive in the spring as little plants, but they grow very quickly into large flowering plants. So the time to get them is some of the small plants from uh, mail order in the spring. I also will put on some bulb booster on, uh, this is a bulb tone, organic bulb fertilizer, and instead of putting it on in the fall, I put it on in the spring when they first come up. Especially the tulips seem to need a little extra boost. And uh, I like to get a couple years out of tulips if I can. 
they don't tend to be long-term perennials in our area. But you can get a couple years out of them if you take care of them and plant them deeply and use fertilizer and also watching the varieties that you plant. Certain varieties, like the little early low ones, tend to be more perennial in this area. I've had some of those for five or six years, whereas the larger ones, the Triumph tulips, are primarily grown for the cut flower trade and the uh, potted Easter plant trade, and they don't tend to come back as well. Daffodils, of course, are a favorite perennial because they do come back, they are perennial and they'll last for years and years and years. Sometimes you'll see daffodils in the middle of a field and they were probably associated with an old farm or house and they've continued to come up even though the residence is long gone. Now it's time to go into the vegetable garden. It's finally time to start the vegetable garden going again. Last week I received in the mail 50 strawberry plants. I only needed about 30, so I did share some with another person, uh, and I've already planted them. Strawberries, when they arrive, you need to get them in the ground, or if you buy the plants, you need to get them in the ground right away. And I've put in about a foot apart, and you plant them at the same level that they were growing. Uh, you can see where the, where the growth point is, and roots down. These have roots about six inches long, so you have to dig a good-sized hole to put them in. These will be here this year. I won't get any strawberries until next year. This year, when they form buds, I will have to take those buds off the berries. And uh, that will strengthen the root system. And then I should be able to get a good crop from them for four or five years. I have some more strawberries down here that I left. And those were planted five years ago. I'm hopeful that I will get a small crop from those this year. And I will fertilize those with a little 10-10-10 fertilizer and then put mulch around them so that the berries don't sit on the ground. We will also cover them with a net to keep the birds out. Last year I had a row of parsley right here that did extremely well. I covered it with some straw and you can see that it's coming up again. Parsley tends to be a biennial. That means it will form foliage the first year and then the second year it will form foliage, but it will go to seed. And that's exactly what will happen to this parsley. However, the nice thing is, is it will give me a supply of parsley, a good supply of parsley, all through the spring. I will plant more parsley, and I'll just keep it going that way so that I'll have parsley almost all year. Today I want to plant a few peas. Uh, peas can go in as early as you can get into your garden. I have three different kinds. I have snap peas, which are eaten with the pod. I have snow peas, which you just eat the pod before it forms peas, and shell peas, and those are the ones that you pick and shell out. And I'm gonna plant some of each in this row. We'll start with the snow peas. And at this point, the gloves come off because I need to feel the seeds. I have already put in a string and used my hoe to form a little trench for them. These are planted about three times their diameter uh, deep. And that's true of most vegetables. And I'm going to plant these fairly thickly and just sprinkle them into the trench. As they come up, we'll need to provide a support for them. And I'm gonna, uh, before I cover them, and I will bring a stake down. I want to use a product that is called uh, Fix and Grow. It's, it's a legume inoculant. You can get it at a local feed store, garden shop, 
And what this is, is this nitrogen fixing bacteria. Peas and beans will actually add nitrogen to your soil. They have the ability to do that. And this helps them to do it. And what we want to do is just sprinkle a little of this. This is a nice one because it's granular. Some of them are very powdery. And the granular seems to work really well here. Just a tiny bit on the peas, and this will help them to fix the nitrogen. And I'll also put a stick in so that I know where one ends and the other one begins. Then we'll just cover them with, again, about three times their depth. And pat it down. And in a couple of weeks, we will start to see some green shoots. In the meantime, I'll figure out how I'm going to support these to keep them growing up instead of on the ground. I will go along and plant my other two varieties right in this row. A little lighter today. We can also plant a couple other crops, and they don't go quite as deep. And that would be spinach and radishes, uh, bunching onions, and our arugula. All very early crops. And I'm going to put in some spinach. Once the peas have uh, grown, we cannot use the space where they grew to plant something later in the fall, too. But the spinach, I'm going to just sprinkle these small seeds finely in the row. And again, these won't get covered as much because they're smaller seeds. Mark that with a rock right now. And again, the legume inoculant would not do anything for this crop because it is not a legume. It will use the nitrogen that the peas last year produced. Spinach is a cool season vegetable. It really prefers it to be cool. And that's kind of uh, dependent on the weather in this area. Sometimes our summer comes quickly and it gets too hot for spinach and it'll go to seed. But we'll continue planting in this row and uh, fill it with the other items, the early items. And again, I want to put a little stick in there. I have some small ones. Just to tell me where the spinach stopped so I don't plant over it with something else. I'll continue in this manner to plant my garden. I do use a ruler to put in my rows and string. It, I just like it a neat garden. You can plant it in uh, squares or some other pattern. But it's nice to have it look neat. We can also put in onion sets. And I picked these up at Agway. And uh, they can go in and grow all year. If I plant them closely, I can get a few uh, green onions. But for the most part, I'll space them out so that I have maximum growth of the onions. And they will be in probably the next row over. Again, I keep a plan of the garden. I've already started it. I have garden 2015. I know where my raspberries are. 
and we have garlic that's already come up right here. This was planted last October. I'll continue filling this in. I know I have in that first row snow peas, so we'll put that in. And I'll continue on down and spinach. And we'll continue with the plan. That way I'll know when I see things coming up what they are and what problems might arise or whether they need some support or cover in case of uh, bad weather or insects. So I always keep track of what is in there ready to come up. I will fertilize again with some uh, organic garden fertilizer this garlic that's coming up. It needs a little extra to get it going. This will be the garlic that we dig in August or September. And you'll see I mulched it last fall, but it's coming up through that. I'll just leave it mulched and it will keep it weeded. And we should have a good crop of garlic come fall. A lot of it, enough to share with family and friends. The other thing that needs to be doing out here right now would be the raspberries. And we need to take out the old canes and add them to the burn pile and get them burned. Uh, you can tell the old canes from the new canes very shortly. The new ones will start to leaf out and already are. The old ones have kind of scruffy uh, stems. The uh, bark is peeling off of them. And those get cut out. Those were the fruiting canes from last year. I have two kinds of berries. These are June bearing berries and we'll get most of our crop in late June or early July and then they will not bloom again. The others I have down here are a later blooming variety and you can see there's a difference in the stems. And these will be completely cut down and they will form new stems that come up, new shoots that will come up from the earth. And this bed also needs to be cleared out a bit and weeded. Yeah, but all these will come down and be burned. The new ones will come up and they will start fruiting in late August and go into September and October. So I can have raspberries for several months by having the two different varieties. Again, they will get some fertilizer and some wood ashes in order to uh, help them out. They like it quite acid and the wood ashes are alkaline and the wood ashes will help with that. Now I'm going to make a flower planter. It's time to plant a few flowers. It's way too early for most annual flowers and most uh, tender vegetables like tomatoes and peppers. They really shouldn't go in until probably at least another month and possibly a month and a half. Uh, they like a warm soil. Um, but there are some things you can plant now, and one of those things would be pansies. And you can also put out sets of lettuce. And I'm going to plant this planter with a, uh, some six packs of lettuce and pansies. I've got a couple of them to do. You, uh, the lettuce comes in two different colors, red or Green, I picked a bright green and a red for another planter. Pansies are in a variety of colors. They're all in the stores right now and really fun to add to your flower beds. They will go dormant. If you cut them off, they may come back in the fall and bloom, or you can just consider them an annual plant. Break a few roots here to get them out. There we go. Lost a flower. But these have roots that have come all the way through, so you know they have a strong root system, maybe a little root bound.
problem is we don't want to break those roots off. So sometimes just shaking it a little or even breaking it open helps to get them out. And just tear them down the side. And Once we get them out, I'll just put them in around the edge. Let's see, we have six. If you keep pansies picked, they will continue blooming for quite a long time. And it's much nicer than looking at empty planters. I also have the lettuce to put in between them. That one came out. This is come, those are coming out a little better. These can be divided up. And the lettuce will actually uh, continue to grow and you can consume it. So you'll have an early crop I planted this planter this way last year and it was very successful. It looked pretty all season, right up until the time that I could add some other things to it. Continue to keep these watered if it's dry season. And I decided it needed something in the center. So I'll put a few uh, branches in the middle just to give it a little height and interest. And we'll just poke some of these bare branches in. These are a red color. Uh, if you have red dogwood, now is the time to prune it. I do have one. And this is the time to prune off their red oldest stalks. If you take off the oldest third every year, the plant will continue to throw nice new red shoots as it continues to grow. We're going to water these in and then I'll plant a similar one with my other plants a little later. The lettuce will fill out considerably and the, as will the pansies and they should fill up this pot nicely. as long as we keep it watered. Now it's time to go back to the shade garden. My favorite plants are hellebores and they grow in the shade, which is nice when you have a lot of trees, but they also bloom extremely early. And these are in full bloom right now. Uh, something nice for the early pollinators. And they come in various colors. There's been a lot of breeding going on with these plants and propagating uh, and hybridizing different varieties one to another to get different colors. Uh, these are a more common color, but I, I like them very much. They're, but there are a lot of new ones, doubles, triples. Right now though, you need to take off the old leaves because they're getting really pretty ratty. And in order to clean up around them, you just need to 
clip back the old leaves. These are not leaves that should go in your compost, however. Many of the cuttings can, but not these. Uh, hellebores have, are poison. Uh, they're not one you want to have if you have anybody around that eats plants. But I'll just be cutting all the old leaves off of this. Once the flowers start to go, new leaves will spring up and be a lot more attractive than these old leaves. This will also give me a chance to see if I have any young ones coming up underneath the plant. They do tend to go to seed and uh, reseed. And I have them that have reseeded throughout this garden. And I like them enough that I leave them. I will share a few, but I do spread them around when they have gone to seed. And again, we'll carefully get these out. The other plant that I like is an epimedium. And again, it has sometimes old foliage that needs to come off before the blooms, which are quite early. Actually a little late getting this job done. It's nice if you can get it done before they bloom, but this year uh, things have just kind of come up all at once. I'll take a few more leaves off and then finish it up a little later. These were covered with a heavy layer of snow, and when the snow melted, there they were, ready to come up. And you'll see I have some young ones coming up right in here that can be transplanted to another area. This gives you the opportunity to come in here and get some of the leaves out. Although in a shade garden, I don't take out all the leaves because a shade garden means there are trees, and where there are trees, naturally there are leaves that fall and saving a few of them to just melt into the soil seems to help the soil and the plants that grow in the shade. We've got snowdrops and squills coming up over here and we've had crocuses, the small crocuses have been a field of color. Uh, just a wonderful set of, of uh, a vista of blue color throughout the ground covers. They've pretty much gone. They will go to seed and we'll probably even have more crocuses next year. This area does need to be raked out. Uh, I do have an epimedium over here. It's, it's uh, starting to put up new shoots. It's a nice little ground cover and it has these shoots, sometimes even full leaves that need to be removed. And we'll just rake those up with the leaves. The uh, plants will show off better if raked up. The other thing that's over here is dogtooth violets. And they aren't really violets. And again, another epimedium. This one does have leaves that can be taken off. But the dogtooth violet is a bulb, and it has a yellow flower. And it's another one that the deer really relish, so you need to spray those. I found out the hard way one year because I lost all of them. The deer just chopped them right to the ground. And they're, these are the dogtooth violets. I have bunches of them in several shady locations. They do like a semi-shade location and they do bloom in yellow and they'll come back year after year and even spread. Now let's head down to the pond and see how that's doing. The pond is looking pretty murky at this point. The fish are still there, they're still alive, and uh, on a sunny day you can see them swimming around. It's time to get it going and get it, get it cleared up as soon as possible. Uh, I put a thermometer in there to check my water temperature my water temperature is approaching 50 degrees, and that's when I'll start feeding the fish. Uh, they really don't come alive much. They're still in kind of suspended animation until the water temperature reaches 50. Because I have a black liner in this pond, 
and the sun comes through when the leaves aren't on the trees, it does tend to warm up fairly fast. It's time to take out the heater, heating unit that kept them from uh, dying this winter. And I had that plugged into a thermostatic plug so that it only came on when it was below freezing. I think it was on much of the winter. This needs to be cleaned off. It's kind of uh, got a lot of algae on it. And we'll clean that off and store it away until next fall. This kept a hole in the pond. Uh, I came out and shoveled over the top of it so that it would continue to keep a hole in the ice. The pond was entirely iced over. And that way the gases that the uh, fish excrement create and also decaying vegetation creates various gases and they can escape and the fish will stay alive. Uh, it lets the some circulation of air and you need an opening in the pond in order for your fish to survive. My neighbor's pump froze up and died. He, he uh, left his pump running rather than having a heat ring and he lost his fish this year. So you have to be a little uh, careful about keeping a hole in the ice or keeping your filtration system running or something in order to keep your pond going. I find this to be the easiest way and I don't have the expense of running a pump and this only runs when necessary. So we'll put that in the shed. I have cleaned the shed for the season and I've got some plants in here already. The celery that we planted earlier has been moved out to the shed. It's a cold, cool weather crop and so it can survive at night. I also have moved out the broccoli and the kale from under the lights. However, I keep some of the landscape fabric just in case we get a really cold spell. I can come out and cover it up for the night. I have a maximum minimum thermometer on the wall. Uh, right now it's about 62 degrees in here. It does warm up quite nicely during the day when the sun's shining. But at night it also gets cold because it's not insulated. So if we have a really cold night forecast, I will cover it with a blanket of the landscape fabric to hold some of the heat in. But most of these crops will take a light frost and they can come out any time. In this garden, as I clean up, and we'll want to uh, cut back any grasses or anything like this as we go. And this can be cut right to the ground. Disposed of, raked up. And you'll see new shoots starting to come up very shortly. This is an oak grass that will grow in part shade. It would probably be a lot larger if it had a little more sun, but it does grow here and it adds a little interest to the shade area, a little variety of texture. This garden is filled with hosta and they're just starting to come up. I have one right here that's uh, poked through the ground. I will be out here with my deer spray very shortly because hosta is another favorite of deer if you've tried to grow them before and uh, they can destroy a plant very, very quickly. So I watch for them to emerge and then uh, use the deer spray and start using it about once a week. And so far that's given me a chance to grow some things that normally they wouldn't be able to do with the deer in the area. Again, I'll be starting the filtration system on the pond, putting in the pump. I have a, a skimmer and a filter, and we'll be putting all those into the pond and putting in some enzyme treatment to hopefully get it started on its way to being clear enough to see down to the bottom and to see the fish. I'll also remove about half the water that's there now and replace it with fresh water. And 50 degrees is about the temperature of the water, town water, that's uh, coming out of the ground and into your hose. So adding it now will not be a shock to the fish.
as long as we do it before it gets really warm. So that's on the list for the next couple of weeks. Hopefully by the time we are here again, it will be done and it will be starting to get clear. Now it's time to go inside and cook a little bit of spring. These are the tomato plants that we started on an earlier episode. Uh, and they've come up nicely and they've formed leaves. I'm starting to add a little fertilizer to the water that's underneath them. And very soon I will be putting them into peat pots with uh, transplanting soil and continuing to keep them watered and growing. In another couple weeks, they'll, when the weather gets even a little warmer and we aren't having as chilly nights, these are very tender. I will move these out to my sunshed and they can grow out on out there for a while. Then I will acclimate them to the air and we'll be putting them into the garden probably around the end of May. That'll be probably another five or six weeks before they actually go in the garden. We want to have as strong a stem on these as we can. And one thing that seems to help is to use a little fan. So when I put these back under my lights, what I'll do is turn on a fan and let it just gently waft them around. If you don't have a fan, you can also just use your fingers to kind of draw, give them a little uh, pat so that they move around a little bit. Supposedly that makes the stem a little bit stronger. When I put them into the peat pots, I will be burying them about up to here so that uh, they can form roots all along the stem. Tomatoes will do that. Uh, so you can have a very sturdy plant when it's time to go in the garden. These are two begonias that I saved over the winter and I had dug them up from outside and I uh, planted the corms a few weeks ago and they made it through the winter. I put them in a uh, bedroom that we aren't using that's kept fairly cool and put them just on a bed of peat moss and I sprayed them with just a little spray of water about halfway through the winter and they made it through very well. I've tried them in colder locations and not been able to save them but these two are doing really well and they will be separated. One of them will go into another pot so that the two will have room to form some nice roots. Now it's time to do some cooking. I said we were going to cook spring and I really meant it because we're going to use a lot of the spring vegetables. They aren't really available out of my garden yet but the stores are filled with them. And so I'm making today a pasta dish and I'm using spring onions and this is, I have already cooked some sliced spring onions and a little sweet onion. You could also use shallots if you had them and I also added a quarter cup of white wine and I let that cook until it formed kind of a glaze on those spring onions. Then we added another quarter, a quarter cup of uh, low fat chicken broth. And right now I'm heating it up again and I'm going to add some sliced Boston lettuce. This is a very tender lettuce and we're going to cook that until it wilts down a little bit, which may take about a minute or so. It won't take very long. It's been in the refrigerator since I cut it up, so we'll just let it wilt slightly. The original recipe that I have serves about six people, and uh, since there are only two that are going to be consuming this, I cut it in half. The French often cook lettuce with peas in the spring, with fresh shelled peas. It's a, a well-known French dish. This uses the same technique a bit. There it started to wilt a little bit. Now I'm going to add three quarters of a pound of asparagus which has been lightly cooked and sliced another spring vegetable, and this is uh, starting to be available. They grow a great deal of asparagus out in western Massachusetts, so we should have some good local asparagus very soon. We'll add a cup of peas. I'm using frozen peas. Fresh peas could be used, uh, in which case you would cook them. The frozen peas 
you just need to thaw. Heat that up a little bit. We're going to add some pasta. Today I've used a campanelli and it's a trumpet shaped pasta. Kind of different. I love to use different shapes of pasta. As I was growing up, the only one available seemed to be elbows, elbow macaroni, and maybe spaghetti. But now we have a lot of different shapes that are available, and it kind of adds a little. This is a thicker pasta, which is a thicker pasta is good for things like the salads and dishes like this. This will be a hearty side dish that will serve with some broiled meat or fish. This is uh, two tablespoons of chopped parsley and a quarter, half a cup of Parmesan cheese. I'm going to add this and stir it around a bit. And add perhaps a little more chicken broth or the pasta cooking water can be used just to give it a little more water. And there we're about finished. I'll pour it into a casserole. Very quick dish if you have everything ready to go. Lost a few pieces. And we'll finish this off with a sprinkle of bacon cooked, crisped, and cut up, and a little drizzle of olive oil. That'll be a nice spring vegetable side dish, hearty enough to go with the garden work you've been, we've been doing. And then we need some dessert. And I've made some cupcakes. And what I'm going to do is hollow out a bit of the cupcake in the center of each. We'll do two of these. Probably have to go all the way to the bottom on these. You can use the crumbs for something else. And then I, these are called strawberry shortcake cupcakes. So I'm going to pop a strawberry that's been cleaned and hulled right into the center of each one. Then I've made some frosting and this frosting was one with cream cheese and also whipped cream. It's not really real sweet. Uh, it does have some vanilla and some almond flavoring, cream cheese and whipping cream. And I'm going to put that in a pastry bag. and frost the top. These will need to be refrigerated once they're done. Now we're going to cover up the strawberry. And there we have strawberry shortcake cupcakes to go along with our spring pasta dish. Put a couple of the big berries on it. This would be a nice, very nice surprise dessert for any type of spring occasion. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Liz Davey, and this has been A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. Please join us next time for the next episode.